Hi, my name is Eric Anzalone. Welcome to another edition of What Matters Most. Today, we're coming to you from Solutions for Daily Living here in Newtown, Pennsylvania. Solutions for Daily Living is a marketplace for the body, the mind, and the soul. And it's run uh, and owned by the lovely Honey Belosi. And as they like to say around here, expand, explore, experience, open to your infinite possibilities. We're here at Solutions for Daily Living to talk to Julie Serrato. Julie hails from the left coast, from the Golden State of California. She is an Ayurvedic guru, to say the very least. Julie is here at Solutions for Daily Living. Note the spelling and the pronunciation. She's here to share her wealth of information on incorporating Ayurvedic principles, uh, yoga, breathing, and nutrition. So come on inside and let's meet Julie. Welcome. Uh, today we have Julie Serrato with us, and what can I say about Julie? She's very well read, very knowledgeable, as indicated by the letters following her name, namely PhD, uh, AP, CAT, CYT. She's a cancer biologist whose Ayurvedic journey began about a decade ago, and since then her path has led her to study uh, and investigate multiple alternative health modalities and pursue degrees in yoga. Uh, Ayurveda and acupressure. She is a certified yoga instructor, a certified Ayurvedic practitioner, and the founder of Wellbeing Integrative Health Consulting, uh, which blends Eastern and Western uh, medicines uh, for a unique integrative approach to health and wellness. She offers consultations that draw from Ayurveda, from aromatherapy and acupressure to help clients take control of their personal health issues, uh, like a bootstrapping uh, method through lifestyle modification and nutrition. Her experience ranges from customizing holistic wellness plans for her clients to nutritional cooking classes to managing and building a yoga and fitness studio. Julie, welcome. Thank you, Eric. So wonderful to be here. Yeah, well, and, and in such a wonderful space here at, uh, at Solutions here in Newtown, Pennsylvania, it Feels right? really good. Yeah. Surrounded by all these crystals. And I know, wonderful. right? Good, good vibes, good vibes. Very much. So, now, let's, how, how does one journey from being a cancer biologist to Ayurvedic medicine? I mean, did you have health issues or what, what was it that brought you into it? Yes, that's a great question. So I actually had several health issues over the past decade or two and involving in, you know, digestion problems, uh, low immunity, and just basically doctors was in and out of hospitals for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I had started to take yoga classes and found yoga as a first love and then started to move into some alternative modalities by taking classes in aromatherapy and this thing called Ayurveda, which is Indian medicine, and found that it made so much sense to reconnect with nature and the seasons. It fit with my body and I started getting healthier. Mm. So I began to go to school for that and then follow along from the allopathic cancer biology setting into an alternative modalities and then now combining the two of them to stay healthy and help others stay healthy. Well, but before you made that transition, did you ever hear about Ayurveda or any of kind of holistic living? And if you did, were you like, okay, that's a little wacko? Because <laughs> being from a scientific background, right? Sure. Absolutely. No, I was hardcore science. Yeah. I was a cancer biologist, did gene therapy, was all about splicing genes and viruses mm -hmm. and being on you know, a ton of different medications, antibiotics all the time. And then realizing, like hearing different things about Chinese medicine, because that's so well integrated into the United States, acupuncture yeah. and herbs, but never really heard about Indian medicine and never really saw that it was based in nutrition and food. And even though I loved food and everything, I didn't know that I could start changing my world and my life so simply. Sure, so sure. no, I didn't have any background with that. Now the entomology of Ayurveda, uh, which uh, it comes from Sanskrit, the uh, I, yes. which is, means uh, life. life, and then Veda, which means the knowledge of or, or something. So it was basically this knowledge of life. Uh, what, what's the history behind Ayurveda? So Ayurveda is something that has come out through originally the oral traditions from what in Indians call the rishis or the seers. So it's a combination of divine wisdom that had been handed down into different bodies of knowledge called the Vedas. So the Rig Veda and Atharva Veda, they're different bodies of knowledge that became 
uh, written down from oral tradition. And then Ayurveda is the science of long life or life that kind of developed in terms of the medicinal body from one of those scriptures. And then from there, there was herbology, there's marma points, which is just okay. like acupuncture, and kind yeah. of developed further into and, and we're talking the science like, it is today. Like 5,000 years ago. I mean, this is not anything years, new. It's the oldest medicine on the planet, according to Indians. Right. And the, the basic, I guess, the, the tenant of Ayurveda is, uh, comes down to digestion, right? Is that, is that the true? Focus of, much? The focus of Ayurveda does begin with digestion. I, I love how you say that, Ayurveda. <laughs> yeah, you Ayurveda. get into the Sanskrit after yeah. a while. It's a beautiful, a beautiful root okay. language. Sorry. No, it's good. The, the, the focus is on digestion because everything breaks down into five elements and then the elements combine into energies, and then the energies reside in the areas of digestion. And when you take care of everything that comes in, into your body, into your mind, and internally through ingestion, and then you have proper elimination, there's a balance that you get with nature that you don't achieve with, with anything else if you don't focus on digestion. So that's a great starting place where practitioners and people can begin to work on their health to help prevent disease from spreading. Right, so Ayurveda, I mean, even though you could use it to, it's used to treat a disease, but it's also preventative. I mean, it's a, it's it's a, a, it's a lifestyle. It's a way of life. Right. Yeah, Ayurveda is not a quick fix. It's not a fad diet. It incorporates right. nature, incorporates digestion, incorporates your daily living, your, your spirit, and it's basically a, a tripartite body, mind, and soul. So when you compare it to traditional medicine, then if, if one went to, uh, to an Ayurvedic mm -hmm. practitioner like yourself, I mean, I, I just picture doctors writing out prescriptions, you know, oh, well, you take, take uh, three of these and get some rest. I mean, is it kind of the same thing where you give suggestions or do you map it out for them? Or it's a good question. do they have to keep coming back to you? Can, is it a one-time visit or? Uh, every practitioner is different. So I've seen in India when I when I was training over there, I've seen practitioners that, that look at you and they're taking everything in and they're so experienced that they know exactly what you need and they can write the exact herb or the exact lifestyle behavior that you need to adopt to make okay. that modification. Myself, I have a little bit more of a a different approach. I ask several questions. There's a, a, a examination that we do by inquiry. There's an examination by observation. And then there is a combination of, sometimes we use pulse technique okay. to read the pulse, and also tongue diagnosis. For me, it's a compilation of all those things, and then I come up with a prescription, or which is a plan, but the prescription could be something as simple as doing a yoga pose, or changing sure. your diet for the day, or something more drastic, like you need an herbal regimen, or, or so, specific market Because part of, part of the way you would uh, uh, diagnose is through observation. So do you just find yourself observing people and saying, we do. oh yeah, that person could use <laughs> this and a little of that, yeah? We do, we do, because we're, I mean, we're not, we're not physicians, so we don't right. get to actually have an official diagnosis, but we do try to offer suggestions that will help them achieve a better state mm -hmm. of being me mentally, physically, and spiritually. So I do observe pretty much everything. Cool. Now, what are the five Ayurvedic elements, and how are they different from the Chinese elements? So the, they're, they're similar in a lot of ways, but there's air and ether, water, fire, and, and earth and those elements break down into different energies in mm -hmm. Ayurveda. And similarly in the Chinese tradition, they have elements as well, and those also form together to have different constitutions. So what you're looking for in both sets of, of uh, medicinal traditions is the constitution that those create and how they balance with nature through the cycles and the seasons of the year. Okay, so then, yeah, so then how would like, I, I'm, I'm a little confused. How then would the diet then? Sure. How does that relate to the five elements? You know, if it's okay. earthy, if it's earth, I'm looking for. Do I have to eat like earthy vegetables, that kind of thing? Or? So there's there's two parts. The first part is you look at what season of the year you're in and what location you're in. The second part is you look at your constitution. So the elements, for example, if you are in the middle of the summer mm -hmm. and it's hot and you're a person who is also of hot nature, has that fire element within them, you need a lot of water and a lot of cooling. So it's pretty logical when you're hot, you need the opposite, sure. you need cooling. So then you would go towards cooling foods like cucumbers or hydrating foods, more water, and maybe a little bit of lime in your water, something that's cooling to the body. Whereas if you're in the middle of winter 
and you are in a cold environment and say you are a very thin person and not very insulated, you have more wind in your body, more air and ether. And so you're going to be affected I'm by... I'm sorry, but you said there's more wind. <laughs> you can't take the teenage boy out of a... I'm sorry. No yeah. problem. <laughs> No, it's kind of true, actually. Okay, really? So if you want to get into all the gas, oh no, but we can we can skip that part. But anyway, but there, you're affected by the wind, so gotcha. you need to take precautions with grounding. So you want hot, warm liquids. Uh -huh. Then, like you want potatoes, you want some meat, things that are solid that are going to ground the body in the middle of the winter and protect yourself from wind elements. Yeah. Which leads us to another part of Ayurveda, which are the doshas, right? And there are three yes. individual th types. Three uh, doshas. doshas. Okay. So vata, pitta, vata, pitta. and kapha. 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 Okay. And so... And can you describe the differences between them? Sure. Vata is this air and ether, predominantly those elements. The Vata phenotype, if you're looking at an individual, is thin, has um, a lot of movement to them. Sometimes they have angular features on their face. They're not necessarily symmetrical. They often uh, are susceptible to hearing problems or... Um, get different infections because they don't have strong immunity. So vata is, is kind of, in, in imbalance vata can be very weak and very sick and vata can drive disease. A pitta constitution is the constitution of fire and water. So these people are very feisty, they're of mid-weight, they, they gain or lose weight very easily but they usually stay pretty much in the middle. They are very symmetrical, they have a, a pink fleshy tone to their skin, they have red hair, they're usually athletes, they're very sharp-witted. Um, the vatas are artistic and music, like music musicians and artists mm -hmm. and dancers, whereas the pittas are maybe lawyers and, and physicians, um, a lot of cerebral activity. And then the last one is kapha, uh, which, which is earth and water, and they're the ones that are grounded. They're the ones that are solid and, and stronger. They have very strong bones. Uh, they're slow in speech. They have wonderful, strong memories, and they are just very peaceful, happy, smiley, loving people. And which one are you? What dosha are you? Or is that a personal question? No, no. Actually, so we're all a combination yeah. of these doshas, but the predominant one, yeah. so my predominant, I'm a pitta vata. Okay. So my predominant dosha is pitta and vata, and they're very close. I don't okay. have a lot of kapha in me, and so I'm constantly seeking out that grounding sure. food or grounding space or grounding meditation. Just from observation of me, I mean, you haven't looked at my tongue yet, but no, um, what, <laughs> uh, which one do you think I am? I believe, or, you know, phenotype, physically, what yeah. I see is a lot of vata, okay. and then pitta behind that. Okay. So you have... A I'm a vata pitta. vata pitta, and you're a pitta vata? Yes, oh, v very wait. close. Yeah, yeah. my name's Eric, I'm a Libra and a Vata. Uh, now, can, can, you, can you be born uh, one dosha and then turn into another dosha? Or, does that happen? Yes, so the, the doshas combined to form a constitution, and the constitution that you're born with, the genetic constitution, is called prakriti. So that's your dominant dosha can come out of that and then later on with all the elements of the world psychological emotional physical anything that's around you you are subject to disease or you're subject to change mm -hmm. that there becomes an imbalance and that's called a vikriti that's your current constitution however you feel right now or like what's been going on recently so what Ayurveda tries to do is balance your vikriti with your prakriti so that you're in constantly in sync with what your original balance was supposed to be. Mm. And the balance comes from a source of genetic factors that includes not just your parents, but everything in the lineage before that. Sure. And then any cosmic influences that you want to. Right, cosmic, into. which uh, Ayurveda, like traditional medicine, is mostly all about physical and, and, a lot and, of it. and mental. And, and mental. But Ayurveda takes it to another level, right? It does. Ayurveda encompasses the body, the mind, the senses, and the soul. Uh -huh. So it's a four-part, a four-dimensional way of looking at the individual because we see the people as, as spirits, as, as you know, your original soul. And mm -hmm. then everything around you is what's been affected by the earth in your life. So, and, and how is then breathing and yoga part of that process as well? What a fabulous question. I, I think that's really important because in yoga, breath is, is called prana. It's, it's the flow. And in yoga and Ayurveda, which are sister sciences, the prana energy is inside of you. And so everything you take in through that energy with breath or with the energy around you is manifested in your cells, in your digestion, in your soul, 
and then that's what grows into either a positive, well-rounded human being mm -hmm. or a diseased and balanced one. And the, the your clients that you've worked with, uh, I mean, how, how have some of your clients, how, how have their lives changed? Are, do, are there any examples? Success stories. Success, yeah, <laughs> success stories, thank you. Yes, I, I think that probably what I've wound up focusing on, and this is all, this wasn't predetermined, it's just what came to me. I, I tend to get very difficult cases with digestion. I've had some cancer cases. People come to me very stressed out. They don't realize that they're imbalanced from the center, their, their gut hurts, they don't know why, and I've been able to correct both their diet and add a lot of yoga and a lot of pranayam, which is the breath work, that energy work, and also use some herbal remedies to bring them back to a normal digestion. And when they had a normal digestion, we also worked on the spiritual aspect because in, in Ayurveda, you want to remove the cause. You can treat the factors. You can treat the symptoms. That's what Western medicine does for the most part until mm -hmm. they find the root. Well, Ayurveda looks for the root as well. Most of the time, the root is something stressful or emotional or psychological that mm -hmm. you need to take off the spirit. Gotcha. And now, th there are going to be some skeptics out there, of course. And um, I believe it was uh, 2008... The, the the journal journal blah, blah, the journal of uh, American of the American Medical Association did like a study on some Ayurvedic medicine or herbs that people obtain online mm -hmm. online online not you know from in person online but they were found to contain uh, trace elements trace elements of metal of, of metal like lead, mercury yes. lead arsenic uh, yeah. so Gemma Gemma and other places they've done studies and so now there's rigorous testing I was actually just speaking to one of the Ayurvedic companies today and they received a shipment in from India and they rejected it because oh wow okay. yeah they they said you know um, we're gonna put this on back order and we're gonna get it to you when we feel it's up to our standards of testing so it has brought attention to the fact that there were trace metals or just different elements that were not supposed to be in the uh, the herbs. But a lot of those heavy metal residues, I think what they found came from this process called fusion to make a basma, where you do take metal and plant and you, you combine them. Isn't that ra Raza Shastra? <laughs> Raza Shastra? Raza Shastra. Oh. There you go. Right. You're all up on the sunscreen. Oh, yeah, man. So it, it does come from this unique process, and if it's not done correctly, then mm -hmm. you can have trace heavy metals. You know, we, we don't, we're not able to track every single thing, but the standards in the industry now are, are much higher and they're looking both online and in person Great. at the sources. And if one wanted to, to try Ayurveda, Ayurveda uh -huh. sorry, I was in Scotland yesterday and I'm in Newtown, Pennsylvania today. That's right. <laughs> Get the brain in gear. Uh, how does one go about, um, how does one go about getting started or do they just could they is something they can do online or should they contact a they can do both professional I, th I think that like I said when I when I was introduced I went to a pharmacy that was giving local lectures and I think going to see a local Ayurveda lecture or your yoga your yoga studio usually they're in touch with Ayurvedic practitioners and mm -hmm. To be able to hear someone speak and to have a consultation is is invaluable. But if you want to start slow, you can also, there's plenty of websites. I have my own website. There's plenty of different websites online where you can go and read about Ayurveda and then literally just go to the library or go to the bookstore and just get a simple book that introduces Ayurveda to you. Because I just have these visions of people now. They go on WebMD and they diagnose themselves they with do. all this. I mean, is there any people danger do. doing that with? I mean, because Ayurveda is not some sort of like woohoo magic thing. It's actually no. real. And I, do, are, are there disclaimers like you could really hurt yourself if you don't consult a professional? I think with the herbology, all of the companies that are reputable have uh, disclaimers on there saying you need to speak with a practitioner mm -hmm. or, you know, if you're under the care of a physician to make sure that you get approved. Because because herbs are the purest form of medicine, and there's just as many contraindications with herbs than with with allopathic medicine prescriptions that you get. So I would read the websites, and then if you're looking to do anything beyond changes in food, and even even then I would speak to a consult uh, a, a practitioner. Yeah. But if you're looking for something further than that, go to a consultation. Okay. Now this last question is something we ask all of our guests. Um, it's the title of the show. Um, what matters most to you? I mean, what's the the lasting footprint or impression you you would like to leave with this planet? With the planet. Well, and the people on it. And the people. Excellent. 
I'd like to be able to offer whatever wisdom I can so that they can bring themselves back to their own true nature. I think people get so far away from who they really are, who they were born to be, and that they're affected by stress and anger and frustration and pain and sorrow and all the negative things in the world. And if they could just get a little bit of faith in their daily life and a little bit of hope and a little bit of balance, I think they'll be able to be in a better state towards a peaceful spirit. Wow, did you rehearse that? That was perfect. <laughs> Never rehearsed that is, anything. That, those are words to live by, I swear. Well, thank you, Julie, very much. It was a pleasure to thank meet you. Thank you, Eric. And, um, Likewise. That's it for today, but before I go, this is Eric Anzalone reminding you that the simplest things in life are what matters most. Namaste. Namaste.